I want to talk for a second to, to introduce what I see as the problem or the problem that I've had with this discussion about the Old Testament, the New Testament, as we've been talking about formations of the canon, how the New Testament writers seem to take what's in the Old Testament and use it in certain ways that seem very odd and weird. Um, this specifically was an issue for me growing up as a Christian and how prophecy gets talked about. And to, to open up this discussion, I wanted to read uh, an excerpt from one of the beginnings of a chapter in Dune. This is from a chapter in, in Children of Dune, which speaks of the children of Paul Atreides, Leto and Ganema, uh, Leto the second to be specific. And, um, and I, I mentioned this in a previous episode. I think I'm going to cut it, this specific quotation reading but um we speak of you know paul atreides in his time and in his place but one of the things that made him special because of his Bene Gesserit training because of his ingestion of spice which is a um which has a lot of psychedelic properties um gives him the ability to see into the future to prophesy to be a prophet and he sees a lot of futures and one of them is his own, and he sees paths that can be taken to, if this action occurs or that action occurs, this is the kind of path you will go down. And the question for him is, which path will he go down of the futures that he sees? Part of the question of the books that come after that are, did he choose the right path, or was there one that would have been better? And so there's discussion, obviously, about futures, about decisions, about rulers about messiahs but also just about prophecy in general and how this functions and i think herbert has something poignant to say on this topic um this is again one of the excerpts from the beginning of a chapter from from children of dune he says either we abandon the long honored theory of relativity or we cease to believe that we can engage in continued accurate prediction of the future and in reading the rest of this quote i want you to think about how you were taught about how the prophets in the Bible spoke of what was to happen, and specifically when they speak of the Messiah. Or we cease to believe that we can engage in continued accurate prediction of the future. Indeed, knowing the future raises a host of questions which cannot be answered under conventional assumptions unless one first projects an observer outside of time, and second, nullifies all movement. If you accept the theory of relativity, it can be shown that time and the observer must stand still in relationship to each other or inaccuracies will intervene. This would seem to say that it is impossible to engage in accurate prediction of the future. How then do we express the continued seeking after this visionary goal by respected scientists? How then do we explain Muad'Dib? I think this idea that Herbert's getting at of if you're going to predict rightfully what is happening, you have to have not only an observer that stands outside of time and place to see what is going on, but whatever happens here also has to stop because even if you can see it here, things might happen here that disrupt whatever you say is going to happen. And so when I was growing up and I was taught about prophecy and biblical prophecy, much of the time had to do with eschatology, the end of time, the end of the world, the you know coming of the kingdom of God and Armageddon and all of this stuff. And it would be talked about as if, well, God, the observer outside of time was giving the prophets these words to say, about what was to happen, say in Daniel, about, about the end of days. And I, always, I was always troubled by this because my initial thought, as Herbert's pointing out, is well, how would they know? This, again, it goes into some discussion about inspiration, right? Is he whispering into the ear of the prophet exactly what to say? Um, and then as I started getting a little bit more mature and reading the Bible, I would look at the 
prophetic books and I would say, I would think, well, they also seem to be talking a lot of things. They also seem to be saying a lot of things to the people that are with them at the moment. So are they just predicting the future? Is that their only role? Or are they saying something to their people in their time and place? Is Isaiah only predicting the future, the suffering servant? Or is he also talking about the exile of Israel? What about Daniel? What about Jeremiah? All of these things. And so that was one issue that I had. And then I learned about how, well, a prophet could say something here that will that is true in his time and place about, say, Israel's exile, but also tells of a future that will, that will also fulfill that prophecy. So there's a double fulfillment that happens. There's some ways in which I can agree with that, but other ways in which I think it's a little bit misguided, especially in terms of thinking of Isaiah's suffering servant. He's not talking about necessarily a specific, like, He's talking as a future hope for Israel, which we can, uh, again, project, and we'll get to this later. But this was my problem with, like, how the canon used itself in terms of prophecy, literally, and then how prophecy, as I grew up, was always talked about. And then I'll, 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 I'll just have one more quotation, and then, Daniel, you can talk about your experience with this kind of thing. And then it gets even more complicated when you start to read the Gospels closely and you see the gospel writers act as like retroactive observers outside of time who tell of a fulfillment of something that wasn't even a prophecy. A good example, a classic example of this um, that we'll reference again later is Matthew 2.15. 